Hi, everyone. Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. We are going on our journey through Romans, and we have reached chapter 9. Chapter 9, one of the most contested passages in all of the scriptures following chapter 8, which is one of the more exalted passages in all of the scriptures, beginning with, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You do not walk according to the flesh, but the spirit. It also says that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and who are the called according to his purpose. And it says that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Such a great statement of our relationship with God through Christ Jesus. And as we get into chapter 9, it's going to seem like a strange hiatus from Paul's usual dissertation, but it's very purposeful and we'll get into that if you would just pray with me, please. Father, as we look into your word, I pray for all the hearts who might hear, that they might receive the truth of what you say in your word, that our lives would rejoice in understanding more of who you are, and that you might help us to come into conformity with your image. So Lord, help us to be like you as we learn in Jesus' name. Amen. So the book of Romans is basically Paul's gospel as we go through, and this is about God's sovereign choice in chapter 9. Romans 9, 13 is the verse that I've selected. I'm sure none of you have it uh, tattooed on you anywhere. It says, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. As we go through, we talk about God's sovereignty, his choosing of those who would be his and him choosing to show grace and make us the trophies of his grace. It can be a very disturbing doctrine as we go through, but if you'll hold tight, we'll just read what the passage actually says. We're in chapter 9, which talks about Israel. 9, 10, and 11 talk about Israel's past, their present, and their future glorification, as we see in the book of Revelation. There's going to be 144,000 uh, that are going to uh, be these little evangelists for the Lord, and they're going to be martyrs. So as we look through the scriptures, we see that God still has a plan for Israel, and he's not done yet. So since these things are true in chapter 8, what about Israel? It's a natural question that Paul comes to because as we think that there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that all things work together for good, and that no one can separate us from the love of God, you have to wonder, well, how can I trust that God will keep his promise to me about all these things? I mean, after all, wasn't Israel chosen by God? Weren't they selected by him from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to David? all the way to Christ, weren't they God's chosen people? And hasn't he let go of them at this point? And so how can we be sure that the God who says we can never be separated from his love, that says all things work together for good, and that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, how can we be sure of that if we see the people of Israel have wandered off and God apparently has let them go? What do you say about God's plan for his chosen people, and if we are his chosen people, could we suffer the same fate as the people of Israel? And so he gets into this question, and he begins with a very strong statement. He says, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all and eternally blessed God. Amen. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for all those who are Israel are not Israel, nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise, as counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have 
a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, having done any, not done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So Paul says essentially that he is absolutely and completely brokenhearted about the people of Israel and how far from God they are. And he says, I wish that for their sakes, I could be cut off from Christ so that they might come to know him. Now, I don't know about you, but my heart just isn't that big and it's just not that soft. Uh, would you be willing to spend an eternity separated from God in eternal fire for the sake of your relatives, the people you're related to. And remember, as Paul is talking about this, he's talking about the people that are pursuing him, stoning him, beating him, harassing him, uh, creating riots around him, trying to put him down, following him from town to town, and absolutely terrorizing him. And he's the one who says, my heart is broken about my people. And I wish I could be cut off for their sake if it could happen. You want to talk about the heart of a minister. You want to know the right heart to evangelize and share with people. That's it. Paul talks about his love for those who don't know the Lord. And he wishes them to know the Lord so much that he said, if I could, I, I would lay down my own salvation so that they could be saved. And I think, my goodness, what an incredible heart that is. And here's Paul that's now talking about God's sovereignty. He's talking about God's election. And he's saying, I wish that I could just lay my life down for these people. Jesus said, there's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We see this in Paul. We've also seen it certainly in Jesus. And he did it literally. And because of his death, we do have life. But as he says this, I have great sorrow and continual grief. It means that this is something that's always in his heart. It's not just when I think about it. He means I carry this on a regular basis. I wonder how many of us carry the burden of lost souls on us moment by moment and understanding that this life will end and there are people who don't know him and that you have the answer. You know Jesus Christ and they don't. I wish I had more of the heart of Paul, that I would be able to do that. For I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Moses went through the very same thing. If you remember, uh, the people broke into an idolatrous mess. They made a golden calf and they began to worship this golden calf, saying the golden calf is the one that got us out of Egypt and completely just fell down on the job and did not do what God wanted him to do. And of course, Moses comes down and he literally breaks the Ten Commandments, all ten of them at once, by throwing them. He's got to go up and get another copy. But these people are just out of control. And the Lord says, I'm done with them. I'm completely done. These people, I'm done with them. I'm, I'm not going to uh, continue with them and be patient. What I'm going to do is I'm going to wipe them all out. And Moses you can continue to have children and I'll raise up a nation from you. Moses expresses his heart of love for the people by saying this. He says in Exodus 32, verses 30 to 32, he says, now it came to pass on the next day that Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin. So now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And then Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, these people have committed a great sin and have made for themselves a God of gold. Yet now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. Moses throws himself at the mercy of God and he says, I would that you would forgive them, Lord. 
but if not, blot out my name. So I see this tendency, even in Jesus as he's at the, at the garden, and he says, you know, not my will, but thy will be done, and he's willing to lay his life down. And he says, I've been called to this very moment. What am I going to do? Pray to the Lord and say, deliver me from this moment? I was born for this moment. Jesus knew that he was there for that moment, and he was willing to lay his life down for us. And I just think about these great men who have gone before us with great examples of a heart of love towards the people who were rejecting, people who were idolatrous, people who gathered around a golden calf and turned their back on the God who brought them through the sea. It's an amazing thing how God shows mercy. And it's at this time where he says, I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And, and then those who don't, he doesn't. It says in verse four, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God and the promises of whom are the fathers and of whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. He says, the Jews really have it going for them. Look at all of how God has been patient with them from the very beginning, from Abraham all the way through with all of these people. And he says, first of all, the adoption. If you remember, Abraham was an Ur of the Chaldees and he was an idol worshiper. He was a nobody. He, he wasn't standing out because of his superior seeking of God or anything else. And God adopted him and he made him a promise which he believed and it was counted to him for righteousness. That happens only to him. And he says, it is your seed, which will be a blessing to all the world. They have the glory. If you remember when they went through the desert, they had this pillar of cloud that would guide them by day and the fire at night that would keep light around them and also guide them. And so there was the glory of God, this uh, beautiful presence of God that led them on and the very fact that wherever it is that they went, God gave them victory as long as they were listening, as long as they were obedient and did what he said. God saw great victories for them and they received it, not because they were the best people around, because time after time after time, you see that they blow it constantly. And yet it's because God was with them and he chose them and selected them. We see that they're also the ones who received the covenants. If you go through from Noah you get to Abraham and Moses and David and the messianic covenant that the Christ would come from the line of David. All of those things were to the Jewish people. God selected them above every other nation in the world and said, I am going to show myself to the world through you. Very often they weren't worthy of that. They didn't rise up to that. And yet God used them anyway and then eventually brought the Christ through that very line. Also, the giving of the law, Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments and the directing of the people and the giving of the laws, which are found in Exodus and Deuteronomy and Leviticus, the sacrificial system, all of that, that God wrote. And he said, this is my declared will. This is how I want you to be governed. This is how I want you to walk. All of that was given to Israel. It wasn't given to anyone else. And God selected them to be his special people. They also have the service of God, the whole sacrificial system, the Levites and the Levitical system of sacrifice for the people, for the covering of sin. God prescribed it for the people of God, the Israelites, not for all the world. And he did that to show himself to the world and ultimately to show Christ to the world. We have the promises, the promises of God that he would come and there would a Messiah would come one day, that there would be peace, that the lion would lay down with the wolf and all of that about how God was going to make everything right, all the injustices would be made right, even when Jerusalem was taken captive and the people were hauled off to Babylon and Assyria. God said, there is a time and I will draw you back and I will bless you and he will right all those things. Even though they had sinned and they deserved everything they got, God said, I'm going to show mercy to you. And he chose them to do that. Who are also the fathers. That's God, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is something in which you and I don't use those sort of terms and in referencing our, um, our lineage, if you will. And yet the Jews did, and they took great pride that they were related to Abraham or they related to Isaac or they were related to, J- to Jacob, which is the people of Israel. All of these blessings that God showed to their forefathers, they inherit that heritage. And it's something they were extremely proud of, and it was quite a a large thing to walk in. So they're blessed, I mean, beyond measure, and not to mention that Jesus Christ himself comes from this line. In fact, God puts his finger on it from Adam all the way down to Mary the Virgin, all the way down to when Jesus is born. These folks have been spoken to and given things that you and I don't have. And we can look back on their rich heritage. We can look back into the scriptures, into the history and understand what a blessing, what a benefit they are to us. Because without which we would have no foundation for what we believe. Because we believe in a Jewish Messiah who came and died for the sins of the world, not just the Jewish people. And in part, we're recipients of that because the Jewish people have turned away from Jesus and were instrumental in pointing him to his death. And yet, God works that together for good for us who are Gentiles so that we get to come know him. So we're blessed that we have the Jewish people and the promises and the fathers and all of that he's given to the Jews, we as Christians can be excited about as well. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Israel, of course, you remember that was Jacob's name. Jacob's name was Jacob. And God said, what's your name? He said, my name's Jacob. He says, no, now your name is Israel. Israel means governed by God. So he gives him a name governed by God. And yet, um, if you look at Jacob's life, he didn't live up to his new name very much. And yet... God said, I've chosen you and you're mine and I'm going to call you Israel governed by God and I'm going to work through you. And he did. What a wonderful thing. And yet not all of those who are Israel who claim to be under the covenants and the law, not all of them are following and being governed by God, which is the point. Just because you're blood related isn't necessarily the thing. And Jesus makes this point in John chapter 8. He says this, I am one who bears witness of myself and the father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. For if you had known me, you would have known my father also. And he said to them, you are from beneath. Now he's speaking to the Pharisees at this point. I from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that if you will die, that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. Well, that's a ridiculous statement. How can you say that you will make us free? I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father and you do what you have seen with your father. Now he's not referring to Abraham here. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth in which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. And then they said to him, we were not born in fornication. We have one father, God. So they switched up. Instead of saying that Abraham was their father, they just attributed God as their father because Abraham wasn't cutting it for them. And he says here in verse 44, you are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources or his own native language, for he is a liar and the father of it. 
He who is of God hears God's words, therefore you do not hear, because you are not of God. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham who is dead? And the prophets are dead. Who do you make yourself out to be? Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, Jesus says, and he, was, he saw it and was glad. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus makes a stunning statement at the end that he is the voice in the burning bush before Moses, as God revealed himself to Moses and said, I am. Jesus claims to be God very clearly. And they took up stones to stone him because they knew he was claiming to be God. What he says here is, you will know who your father is by how you behave. And there's only two, either God is your father or the devil's your father. The devil is the father of everyone, by the way. Most people don't claim that unless they have some strange twisted reason for doing so. And yet God is our father. We always say we're children of God. And yet Jesus disputes them saying that they're the people of God because they're descendants of Abraham. That doesn't cut it. They didn't have the faith of Abraham. Abraham was the father of all the faithful. It's not about who you're related to by blood. It's who you're related to in spirit and who you obey, either God or the flesh, which would be serving the devil. So just because someone is called a Jew, or even just because someone is called a Christian, doesn't necessarily mean that the tag fits the person just because they say it. They've got to prove it. They've got to live it. And Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. Even though they were related to Abraham and they could prove it probably with paperwork, they were not related to Abraham and his faith. They did not exemplify his faith in God. And so therefore they were cut off. Verse seven nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed shall be called. That is those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. So you see, it's not about who you're related to. And first of all, they're going to say it has to do with a blood relation to Abraham. And yet, if you think about it, Abraham had more than one son, even in his old age when the Lord had come and said to him, I will come back to you this year, uh, at this time next year, and you will have a son. You and Sarah will have a son. This is after he contrived to have his own son through another woman, figuring, well, maybe God's going to answer his promises differently than maybe I think. And so I'll sleep with this maidservant and have a child and ta-da, and it happened to be Sarah's idea, a very bad wifely advice that she gave to him. And yet he propagates a son, his name is Ishmael, through Hagar, who is his servant. And guess what? God fulfilled his promise through the woman he said he would, which is Sarah. And so Sarah has a child and they name him Isaac, which means she laughs. And he becomes the son of promise. So just because you're related to Abraham, I mean, all of, everyone in Saudi Arabia is basically related to Abraham. Everyone in Kuwait is related to Abraham. And yet they're not all the children of Abraham. It has not necessarily the blood relation to Abraham because he had two sons. And yet God only recognized one that was the son of promise because that was the promise, uh, that was the son of promise that he said he would give. And so if you remember the three visitors that come and, and talk to Abraham, Abraham has to send away Hagar and her son because God said, he's not the one. He's not your, really your son. Isaac is your son. And it says here in Genesis 22, 2, and then he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. If you, if you understand what happened in Genesis 22, God asked him to take his son, his only son. And it's interesting that God would say that because he had a previous son. 
but God never recognized him as legitimate, as real, because he didn't choose him. He chose Isaac. And then he tells him, I want you to take Isaac to a mountain where I'll show you, and I want you to offer him as a burnt offering to me. He means a literal slaughtering and burning up of his only son. And Abraham does this. He does it on a mountain known as Mount Moriah, in which many years later, Jesus was to be crucified, where God puts his only son on display to be mocked and to die for our sin. And that is really the beauty of Christmas. That's the beauty of God's gift to this world. Not that God came and was destroyed and sacrificed because of our sin, but that God loved us so much that he sent his son so that by having faith in him that we might be saved. That's the beauty of Christmas and that's the real meaning. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. So if you remember, he was about 100 years old. She was about 90. They were 10 years apart. Uh, so there's not a problem if you want to marry somebody 10 years apart. Uh, they did it in the Bible, and, and a lot of those were marriages they didn't even have a choice on. But God comes to him and says, listen, I'm, I'm going to come to you the same time next year, and you're going to have a son through Sarah, which is a little dubious, considering that both of them are pretty washed out as far as procreation is concerned. And yet, exactly as God had said, just as he promised, miraculously, they have a son whose name is Isaac, and he becomes their son, their only son. And then God asks for him back at some point in time. You'll find that God will give you things and he will test you to see if you're willing to give them back or if perhaps your grip is a little too tight on those things. And I would just advise you, if the Lord asks you to give something up and to give it away, loosen your grasp and let it go. If the Lord would have them back, whether they be children or things or jobs or hopes and dreams or plans, whatever they are, just be willing to let them go. Because if God has promised you that he loves you above all things and that you can never be separated from the love of God, it's not depending upon the thing that you find so important. And God will work it out and you'll see. He always has. In Genesis 15, 6, it says, and he believed the Lord and it was accredited to him or accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham showing what it is to be a son of God believed God. And if you're a son of God, you believe God and you believe what God says. And that's the difference between somebody that is related to him as a child and somebody that is not, that just might be related by blood to people who did have faith. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have faith or that you'll be saved. You can't ride in on the coattails of someone else. In fact, God has no grandchildren. He only has children. You are either a first person born again of God or you're not. There's no way you're going to get in on the righteousness of your parents or the righteousness of your grandparents or any of that. It's because God is in your life personally and you've been born again of the Spirit of God. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, uh, Rebecca was the wife of Isaac, even our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Now this is a very contested passage in the scripture. Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Before they ever did anything, these twins, which were in her womb, she was concerned. Rebecca said, listen, I got this battle going on. These two guys are just constantly fighting inside me. What is going on here? And being that these were her only children that she's had, she goes before the Lord and says, what's going on? And the Lord says, there are two nations in your belly. I wasn't, wasn't expecting that. But he said, there's two nations in your belly, two great nations. And yet, the older will serve the younger. Now, of course, it was the tradition of that time for the older to be in charge. They would inherit a double blessing from the father. They would be the ones that would basically inherit the, the lion's share of property. They would be the ones that all the pressure would be on, much like a firstborn is somewhat 
today, a lot of the pressure of breaking boundaries and so forth is on, on the shoulders of the firstborn. And yet he spoke to her and said, the older will serve the younger. And the way they figured that out was the first one out of the womb. He got a scarlet thread tied around his wrist. Well, it just so happens that his brother pulls him back in <laughs> and another one comes out first and then comes out, uh, it comes out his brother. So here comes Esau, all red and hairy. And they call him Esau because he was red and hairy. It means, it means red. And the whole land of Edom gets inhabited by his ancestors. And they call it Edom because it's of his redness and also the redness of the rock. And you have Jacob. And so you have two twins who are both related to Abraham. They're both related to Isaac. They're both related to Jacob. And yet here you have these, or they're, they're both related to Isaac and Rebekah. And they're both equal. They're twins even out of the womb. And God selected one over the other before they were ever born, before they ever did anything good or bad, so that it might be according to God's election and not works. This is a disturbing thing for us, especially if we believe that God accepts us on the basis of our perfection. And the more perfect you are, the more God loves you. And the less perfect you are, the less God loves you. And then when we hear a passage like this, we wonder why it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. And it's one of those irritating things that you wish you could answer. How is it that God takes two children in the womb and he selects one over the other? And he says, Jacob, I loved and Esau, I hated. It's a disturbing passage for a lot of people. I've, I've kind of come to grips with it because I believe God is sovereign and in charge of all things. And if he picks me or he doesn't pick me, he has a right to pick me on his team or not pick me on his team. In fact, he has every right to not pick me on his team. And yet he picked me to be on his team, which is an amazing thing. It's not that he didn't choose Esau. It's that he chose Jacob. If you look at his track record, he's just no kind of a man's man. He's no kind of a real stand-up guy. He's, he's running in fear. He steals a birthright. He has to run away from his brother. He's, he's an avoider to the max. Uh, he, you know, he runs away, puts his tail between his legs. And then when he comes back, he, he tries to bribe his brother so his brother doesn't kill him. And he's just always, he's wrestling with God. And he says, don't, don't let go of me. And I'm not going to let go of you until you bless me. And I mean, he's just this really, he's a mama's boy, essentially. And uh, when Rebecca dies, he falls to pieces until he gets a wife, but, or, or when his mom dies. But anyway, bottom line is this. God chose Jacob over Esau before they did anything right or wrong. So does it matter who you're related to? Well, Esau certainly was related, and yet God chose Jacob. God chose Jacob while he was still in the womb, and he was a twin. It was told that the, young, the older will serve the younger, but then Malachi, 1,500 years later, quotes this passage and he says, the older, not the older serving the younger, but Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. By the way, the original intent of that word is not him I hated. It's basically, if you choose an apple over an orange, you are choosing the apple, you hated the orange. It doesn't mean you hate the orange. It means that is the one that you did not choose. That is the one less preferred, if you will. And so it's not an emotional word where God had a vendetta against a baby who never did anything right or wrong. It's God chose regardless of what they did. And yet God chooses on the base of his foreknowledge. Now, I'm not sure how that all works. I am sure God does not say, well, if I choose you, let's see how time goes. And he goes forward in time to see how it worked out. God doesn't do that. People in sci-fi movies do that. People in Star Trek do that. But they don't do that. It, God doesn't do that in real life. He chooses, and we see every single time that God chooses, God chooses rightly. How does he do it? I don't know. But I know that he does. To say that he doesn't would be to say that I don't believe, and I don't believe what the Scripture says. And the Scripture is very, very plain about it. When I understand God's sovereignty in my life, the only thing I can do is really worship and be thankful and tell other people. 
because I don't know who else there is. It's like going fishing. You never know what you're going to find when you throw your pole in. And you know if there's fish in that lake, there's fish to be caught. So evangelism is like that. There are people who are his which you don't know yet. And you may get the opportunity to partner up with God and be an instrument of his to be able to share the gospel. What a privilege that God would make us trophies of his grace. And that's what it is, it says in Ephesians, that we would always and for eternity be those who people will see in heaven and go, you see that guy there? That shows just how gracious God is because that dude's a bonehead, or at least he was a bonehead until he was uh, elevated up in heaven. And yet that is what God has done for us as he chooses us. And so the best thing we can do is accept it with joy. And so before either one of them had done anything right or wrong, just so that election, God's election, that it is his purpose, that it is his choice, that it's not ours, would stand, he said, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And so we see later, Jacob, who's the mama's boy, and Esau, who's the man's man, I would not have chosen if I were God, Jacob. I would have probably chosen Esau. Um, but sometimes God chooses people like Esau, much like Samson and others that I understand, like Saul. He chooses him to be his leader for a time, to show himself to Israel. And yet, it is all by God's choice, by his sovereign election. And that is one of the characteristics of who God is. You can't tell him what to do. You can't change his mind. God already has it rigged. The dice are rigged. And God already knows what's going to happen. And he's making it happen. Which is why all things can work together for good. For those that love the Lord. For those who are called according to his purpose. That's the only way God can do it. Is if he's the only one who's in charge. We don't change anything. We get on board with what he's doing or we're his enemy. So next time in chapter nine, we'll move on to this. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? In other words, his choosing, his calling, his selecting, not based upon anything that we do? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills nor of him who runs, which are explanations of our, our actions, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says of the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills, he hardens. And you will say to me, why does he still find fault? In other words, how can God call us guilty of anything if we're just doing what he's called us to do? If he selects us or doesn't select us, how can God hold us accountable for evil deeds done in the body? That's a very good question. For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel of honor and another of dishonor? The explanation is this, God is God. And if you have a problem with that, you should really dig and find out why. God is God and he can do whatever he wants. And he chooses to show love and grace to some is it you? He also gives a call out into all the earth and he says, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus tells that we should come to him and learn from him because he is meek and humble of heart. It is an invitation that is given to the entire world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. If you don't know Jesus today, cry out to him from your heart. And if you know Jesus, you should cry out from your heart and say, thank you that God chose you. As we're moving closer to the, um, the day we call Christmas, 
I really don't know what you have planned or where you'll be going or who you'll be with, but I don't know if it will snow, if you'll be frosty or not. It seems like it's been rather warm. And I don't know what sort of special guests will be leading you, uh, leading your sleigh at your home or where you will be going, like uh, watching the various movies that we have that are available or even what you believe, whether you're going to have a white Christmas or you're going to have a Christmas story. Everyone's going to have a Christmas story. And I'm not sure if you'll even be home alone or whether you'll be home alone too. But no matter what it is that you do, I hope that you enjoy your family and that they're close by and that you're having a bit of a vacation and that you understand the real meaning of Christmas, as Linus tells us from the book of Luke. I hope that you wouldn't become like Scrooge, at least the earlier form of Scrooge, and that you wouldn't become so down because of the coronavirus, that you wouldn't be a Grinch and poo-poo the entire thing. I also hope that you have a wonderful life wherever it is that you are, because Christ Jesus is in your life and he has performed a miracle for you this Christmas. I pray that the Lord bless you today and all the days leading up to that time and that he may give you a special revelation of who he is at this time of year. Amen.